Before we dive into technical analysis, we need to get you set up with some charting software. As such, I will now walk you through my TradingView setup, including my watch list, the indicators that I use, and the display settings. Watch this video at the link below before proceeding to the next slide. So what is a candlestick? In the world of chemistry, the most basic concept to grasp is that of elements, as they are the basis upon which the study of chemical compounds is pursued. In the world of trading, the most basic concept to grasp is that of the candlestick. While we don't need to offer a comprehensive history of candlestick trading, it's worth noting here that this method goes back to at least 17th century Japan, but it only became widely adopted in Western markets in the 1980s. Now, almost every reputable trader, investment firm, and market analyst studies candlestick charts. So how do they work? At their core, every single candlestick gives us five main pieces of information. One, the opening price of the selected time frame. Two, the closing price of the selected time frame. Three, the highest that the price reached during the selected time frame. Four, the lowest that the price reached during that time. And five, if the price closed higher or lower than it originally opened during that period of time. For the green candlestick on the left, the body of the candle is defined by the range between the opening and closing prices of the selected time frame. In this instance, the price closed higher than it originally opened, and therefore the body of this bullish candle is green. For the red candlestick on the right, by contrast, we see that the price closed lower than it originally opened, and therefore the body of this bearish candle is red. Do note, however, that the colors are customizable. Most charting software gives you the ability to use whatever color that you want to identify bullish and bearish candlesticks. Apart from the body of these two candles, you will also notice an upper and lower wick. The upper wick on every candle identifies the highest the price reached during the selected time frame, whereas the lower wick on every candle identifies the lowest the price went during the same period of time. The reason that traders typically prefer candlestick charts over simple line charts is because they provide us with a wealth of extra information. While it's true that a basic line chart shows us the price at a particular moment in time, it does not show us the open and the close or the high and the low. And because of that, traders who use line charts are theoretically at a disadvantage as they lack vital information about price action over time, including whether buyers or sellers are currently in control. This point is important because candlesticks, like snowflakes, all come in different shapes and sizes. For those who understand what they're looking at, the size of both the body of the candle and its wicks tells us a story. When the body is long on a green candle, this indicates that there was strong buying pressure driving the price up significantly. The large red candle on the right, by way of contrast, indicates that there was strong selling pressure driving the price down. As we will see later in the course, however, not every large candle is suggestive of continued movement in the same direction. The volume behind every move in price must also be taken into consideration when evaluating whether a significant move in price is truly strong or if there is an anomaly that ought to caution us against the notion of trend-based continuation. Now, even though they are not as impressive, the smaller bodied candles are just as important. They reveal that neither buyers, the green candle, nor sellers, the red candle, dominated the other throughout the selected time frame. Rather, there was very little volatility in price action, which is helpful information to have when considered alongside factors such as support and resistance, trends, volume, etc. The size of the wicks also tells us a story. For the candle pictured on the left, the long upper wick reveals that during the selected time frame, buyers pushed the price higher for a time before sellers subsequently stepped in and drove it back down. When this occurs at the top of an uptrend, this is one potential indication of an incoming trend reversal. The inverse is true for the candle pictured on the right. Here, the long lower wick suggests that even though sellers attempted to drive the price down, buyers stepped in and pushed it back up. When this occurs at the bottom of a downtrend, this is one potential indication of an incoming trend reversal. All that to say, the size of a candle's body and its wicks 
provides us with a wealth of information, especially when viewed in relation to the candles that precede and follow it. As such, identifying candlestick patterns is an important part of the trader's job. One of the candlestick patterns that often occurs at pivotal moments is the doji candle. In and of itself, the doji candle pattern is neutral in terms of price direction. It reflects market indecision. This is due to the fact that the opening and closing prices are almost exactly the same, regardless of how high or low the price moved throughout the course of the selected time frame. But it does not have to be exact to be considered a doji. A candle's body can generally represent up to 5% of the size of the entire candle's range and still be classified as a doji. At any rate, the doji pattern conveys a battle between buyers and sellers, with no side being able to claim outright victory. That being said, when taken in combination with other factors, such as the current trend, volume, and more, doji candles can indicate potential reversal and, as such, are an important to look out for at the top and bottom of impulse movements in price action. Speaking of trends and price action, let's turn our attention to some of the bullish candlestick patterns that are relatively easy to identify. To begin, let's turn our attention to what is commonly referred to as the bullish engulfing pattern. A bullish engulfing pattern forms when the body of the current green candle completely encompasses or engulfs the previous candlestick, including the body and its wicks. In theory, it doesn't matter whether the previous candle is red or green or even a doji, though typically you will see the bullish engulfing candle follow a smaller red candle. When a bullish engulfing candle emerges at or near the bottom of a downtrend, this is frequently regarded as an indication of potential reversal. Due to the large size of the bullish candle, this is suggestive of strong buying pressure. As with all candlestick patterns, however, trend reversal is not guaranteed. But if it is in fact the start of an uptrend, do remember that breakout attempts are commonly followed by a retest, so it is advisable not to chase with a bullish trade near the top of a bullish engulfing candle. The next bullish pattern that we will consider is the Dragonfly Doji. As the name suggests, this candlestick pattern shares the common characteristic of all doji candles, wherein the opening and closing prices are almost exactly the same. The feature that sets the dragonfly doji apart is its long lower wick and a very small upper wick, if there even is one. As mentioned above, the long lower wick indicates that after sellers initially drove the price lower, near the beginning of the candle, buyers stepped in and drove the price back up. When this happens near the bottom of a downtrend, a dragonfly doji is frequently regarded as an indication of potential trend reversal. Sellers are losing control of price action and buyers are gaining more confidence. A similar phenomenon is observable with the hammer candle. Like the dragonfly doji, the hammer candle has a long lower wick, signaling seller exhaustion and buyer strength. The difference is to be found in the body of the candle. Whereas the dragonfly doji has an exceptionally small body, less than 5% of the size of the candle's entire range, the hammer candle has a noticeable body and virtually no upper wick. The hammer candle is found at the bottom of a trend, typically when a stock begins to find support after a period of price decline. A strong bounce off of support, as evidenced by the long lower wick, indicates that buyers believe this is a good area in which to buy the stock. Though not guaranteed, this is often a recipe for bullish price action in the candles that follow. Unlike the hammer candle, the inverted hammer has a long upper wick with and little to no lower wick. One paradox about the inverted hammer is that, typically speaking, a long upper wick is considered to be bearish. If buyers tried to push the price up, but then sellers stepped in and pulled it back down, then would this not mean that buyers are weak and sellers are strong? Usually, but not if this pattern forms at or near the bottom of a downtrend. When an inverted hammer appears near the bottom of a downtrend, this is an indication that A, 
buyers are willing to step in at this level, and B, even though sellers were able to respond, they were not able to push the price down far enough to invalidate buyer confidence. Be careful here though, because the long upper wick, characteristic of the inverted hammer, can occasionally be a fake out, resulting in a bull trap. Consequently, if you notice what appears to be an inverted hammer near the bottom of a downtrend, make sure to find confluence with other indicators and on multiple time frames if you are attempting to trade a reversal. A safe way to assess whether or not an inverted hammer is in fact a bullish setup is to wait until the following candle forms. If the next candle is long and green, this results in what is referred to as a morning star pattern, reversal pattern. The morning star candlestick pattern is a sign of optimism for bulls after a period of market decline. It is a three candle pattern with one short bodied candle found after a long red candle and before a long green candle. The short bodied candle can be bullish or bearish. It can be a doji, a dragonfly doji, a hammer, an inverted hammer, a spinning top, or several other possibilities. The point, however, is that it will have a relatively small body and it will be found at or below the bottom of the candles that precede and follow it. Now, some technical analysts will consider it will only consider it a morning star if there is a gap down from the close of the first candle to the open of the second candle and a gap up from the close of the second candle to the open of the third candle. Personally, I think we can use some flexibility in our judgment here, even if there are not clear gaps either before or after the body of the middle candle. The important thing is that the final candle in the sequence is strong and that it closes above the midpoint of the first candle. If that takes place, then this pattern signals the strong likelihood that a bullish trend reversal is underway. Sellers failed to push the market down significantly in the second candle, and buyers pushed it up considerably in the third. A tweezer bottom is a two candlestick pattern that occurs near the bottom of a downtrend with a bullish green candle following a red candle with approximately the same size body. Even though the sellers were strong in the previous candle, the buyers stepped in convincingly in the following candle erasing all of the seller's previous efforts. As such, this pattern is regarded as a potential indication of trend reversal, but caution, again, should be advised here. Very often, what appears to be a tweezer bottom is simply temporary market equilibrium and or indecision. Reversal is not guaranteed simply because of one strong performance from buyers. Likewise, for the spinning top. The spinning top pattern is characterized by a short bodied candlestick, whether it's red or green, with roughly equally sized upper and lower wicks. In and of itself, the spinning top indicates market indecision with no meaningful change in the price over the selected time frame. When found at the bottom of a downtrend, however, a spinning top <coughs> suggests that the sellers are running out of steam and that buyers have an opening to regain control of price action. The difference between a spinning top and a doji can sometimes be hard to detect, but technically it comes down to this. Whereas a doji candle has little to no body at all, less than 5% of the candle's overall range, the body of a spinning top is still small, but it's notably, noticeably larger. Like a doji, however, even though a spinning top may signal weakness in the present trend, it does not guarantee trend reversal confirmation across multiple patterns and indicators, including on different time frames, is needed to assess whether trend reversal seems likely. The bullish abandoned baby pattern is a three candle setup that appears at the bottom of a downtrend, signaling potential reversal. The characteristic feature is the second candle in the pattern, regardless of whether it is red or green. The second candle, including its upper wick, should have a gap between it and the wicks of the large red candle that precedes it and the large green candle that follows it. In other words, there is a gap that remains on the chart both prior to the second candle and after it. 
This is what distinguishes the bullish abandoned baby from the morning star reversal pattern. The gap up following the middle candle, the abandoned baby, along with the strong buying power behind it, gives bulls a degree of confidence that the downtrend may be coming to an end. If this pattern is accompanied by an increase in volume in the third candle, this is additional confirmation that an uptrend may be on the horizon. But what about bearish candlestick patterns? So far, we've only discussed bullish setups. We now turn our attention toward patterns that indicate downside may be imminent. Fortunately for us, the following patterns are essentially the inverse of the bullish patterns identified above. To begin, let's consider the bearish engulfing pattern. A bearish engulfing pattern forms when the body of the current red candle completely encompasses or engulfs the previous candlestick, including the body and its wicks. In theory, it does not matter whether the previous candle is red or green or even a doji, though typically you will see the bearish engulfing candle follow a smaller green candle. When a bearish engulfing candle emerges at or near the top of an uptrend, this is frequently regarded as an indication of potential trend reversal. Due to the large size of the bearish candle, this is suggestive of strong selling pressure. As with all candlestick patterns, however, trend reversal is not guaranteed. But if it is in fact the start of a downtrend, do remember that breakdown attempts are commonly followed by a retest, so it is advisable not to chase with a bearish trade near the bottom of a bearish engulfing candle. The next bearish pattern that we will consider is the Gravestone Doji. As the name suggests, this candlestick pattern shares the common characteristic of all Doji candles, wherein the opening and closing prices are almost exactly the same. The feature that sets the Gravestone Doji apart is its long upper wick and a very small lower wick, if there even is one. As mentioned above, the long upper wick indicates that after buyers initially drove the price higher near the beginning of the candle, sellers stepped in and drove the price back down. When this happens near the top of an uptrend, a gravestone doji is frequently regarded as an indication of potential trend reversal. Buyers are losing control of price action and sellers are gaining more confidence. A similar phenomenon is observable with the shooting star pattern. Like the gravestone doji, the shooting star candle has a long upper wick signaling buyer exhaustion and seller strength. The difference is to be found in the body of the candle. Whereas the Gravestone Doji has an exceptionally small body, less than 5% of the size of the candle's entire range, the Shooting Star has a noticeable body and virtually no lower wick. The Shooting Star pattern is found at the top of a trend, typically when a stock begins to find resistance after a period of price increase. A strong rejection off resistance, as evidenced by the long upper wick, indicates that sellers believe this is a good area in which to short the stock. Though not guaranteed, this is often a recipe for bearish price action in the candles that follow. Unlike the shooting star candle, the hanging man has a long lower wick and little to no upper wick. One parado paradox about the hanging man, though, is that, typically speaking, a long lower wick is considered to be bullish. If sellers tried to pull the price down, but then buyers stepped in and pushed it back up, then would this not mean that sellers are weak and buyers are strong? Usually, but not if this happens at or near the top of an uptrend. When a hanging man appears near the top of an uptrend, this is an indication that A, sellers are willing to step in at this level, and B, even though buyers were able to respond, they were not able to push the price up far enough to invalidate seller confidence. Be careful here though, because the long lower wick characteristic of the hanging man can occasionally be a fake out, resulting in a bear trap. Consequently, if you notice what appears to be a hanging man near the top of an uptrend, make sure to find confluence with other indicators and on multiple time frames if you are attempting to trade a reversal. A safe way to assess whether or not a hanging man is in fact a bearish setup is to wait until the following candle forms. If the next candle is long and red, this results in what is referred to as an evening star reversal pattern. 
The evening star candlestick pattern is a warning sign for bulls after an impulse wave up. It is a three candle pattern with one short bodied candle found after a long green candle and before a long red candle. The short bodied candle can be bullish or bearish. It can be a doji, a gravestone doji, a shooting star, a hanging man, a spinning top, or several other possibilities. The point, however, is that it will have a relatively small body and it will be found at or above the top of the candles that precede and follow it. Now, some technical analysts will only consider it an evening star if there is a gap up from the close of the first candle to the open of the second candle and a gap down from the close of the second candle to the open of the third. Personally, I think we can use some flexibility in our judgment here even if there are not clear gaps either before or after the body of the middle candle, the important thing, in my view, is that the final candle in the sequence is strong and that it closes below the midpoint of the first candle. If that takes place, then this pattern signals the strong likelihood that a bearish trend reversal is underway. Buyers failed to push the market significantly higher in the second candle and sellers pushed it down considerably in the third. Another bearish setup is known as the tweezer top. A tweezer top is a two candlestick pattern that occurs near the top of an uptrend with a bearish red candle following a green candle with approximately the same size body. Even though the buyers were strong in the previous candle, the sellers stepped in convincingly in the following candle, erasing all of the buyers previous efforts. As such, this pattern is regarded as a potential indication of trend reversal, but caution should be advised here. Very often, what appears to be a tweezer top is simply temporary market equilibrium and or indecision. Reversal is not guaranteed simply because of one strong performance from buyers, likewise for the spinning top. The spinning top pattern is characterized by a short bodied candlestick, whether red or green, with roughly equally sized upper and lower wicks. In and of itself, the spinning top indicates market indecision with no meaningful change in the price over the selected time frame. When found at the top of an uptrend, however, a spinning top suggests that the buyers are running out of steam and that sellers have an opening to regain control of price action. However, even though a spinning top may signal weakness in the present trend, it does not guarantee trend reversal. Confirmation across multiple patterns and indicators, including on different time frames, is needed to assess whether trend reversal seems likely. The final bearish candlestick pattern that we will consider in this section is known as the bearish abandoned baby. The bearish abandoned baby pattern is a three candle setup that appears at the top of an uptrend, signaling potential reversal. The characteristic feature is the second candle in the pattern regardless of whether it is red or green. This second candle, including its lower wick, should have a gap between it and the wicks of the large green candle that precedes it and the large red candle that follows it. In other words, there is a gap that remains on the chart both prior to the second candle and after it. This is what distinguishes the bearish abandoned baby from the evening star reversal pattern. The gap down following the middle candle, the abandoned baby, along with the strong selling power behind it, gives bears a degree of confidence that the uptrend may be coming to an end. If this pattern is accompanied by an increase in volume in the third candle, this is additional confirmation that a downtrend may be on the horizon. All right, everyone, we have just discussed 16 basic candlestick patterns that provide us with a wealth of information about trends, reversals, and price action. With these basic patterns under our belt, we can now turn our attention to some advanced patterns that we also need to be familiar with. Let's begin with the bullish piercing line pattern. This two candle pattern forms when, after a gap down following the close of the original red candle, the second candle closes green and above the 50% level of the preceding bearish candle. This pattern is not as pronounced as the bullish engulfing candle, however, 
as the body of the second candle does not fully encompass the candle that precedes it. Because of this, one ought to regard this piercing pattern with a degree of caution, whereas an engulfing candle demonstrates that buyers are clearly strong, the reliability of this piercing pattern signaling reversal depends upon other factors, especially volume, which we'll discuss later on. Be that as it may, because the buyers in the second candle were able to erase over half the seller's efforts from the previous candle, this pattern can, when it appears at the bottom of a downtrend, signal possible trend reversal. Even though sellers were strong, buyers were able to pause the downtrend and put on a display of strength. Next up is the three white soldiers pattern. This pattern consists of three consecutive green candles, all relatively long in size, that close higher than the previous candle. Now, as an aside here, the name originates from those who use white-bodied candlesticks for bullish candles, so that's the, dis the, uh, the discrepancy right there. Anyways, typically speaking, the pattern requires that each of the subsequent green candles opens inside the body of the previous session's candle. But we can show some flexibility here because remember this is an art rather than a science. When this pattern forms at the bottom of a downtrend, the length of these three consecutive green candles indicates that buyers have stepped in with strength. The price decline from the previous downtrend is being erased and bulls are starting to become confident. This V-shaped bottom is relatively rare, however, as most breakout attempts are followed by a retest. It's therefore ill-advised to chase with a bullish trade near the top of that third green candle. Consolidation and or a healthy pullback are often required for further con continuation to the upside. Speaking of healthy pullbacks, let's consider the rising three pattern. Unlike the previous reversal patterns, the rising three method is a continuation pattern. When it appears during a rising uptrend, for example, the presence of three small-bodied candles in a pullback suggests that further upside is possible. The relative inability of sellers to drastically pull down the price of the stock indicates that buyers have the ability to retake control and continue the uptrend. This pattern will become even more important when we consider Fibonacci retracement levels, volume, and more later on in the course. For now, the important thing to note is that three small bearish candles following a large green candle suggests that the rally is not yet over. Be careful though, because three large red candles following an uptrend is actually a bearish pattern, one that we will discuss below. The next pattern to consider is the bullish harami or inside bar pattern. The term harami comes from Japanese, meaning pregnant. The name of the bullish harami pattern thus derives from the fact that the green candle is inside the range of the body of the red candle that precedes it. This inside bar pattern is typically bullish, as buyers were able to consolidate price action, theoretically bringing the downtrend to completion. As with all patterns, volume is particularly important here, as we shall see more fully later in the course. Finally, let's consider the bullish island reversal pattern. A bullish island reversal pattern forms when there is a gap down to a series of candles, followed by a gap up in price. These islands typically form when a trend is in its final stages, one final move that causes maximum pain for those who have been trying to play a potential reversal. It's important to wait for confirmation before entering, however, as not every gap down in price should be construed as an island in the making. Further downside cannot be ruled out. That is why it is safer to wait for reversal to confirm prior to going long on the underlying security. With that in mind, let's turn our attention towards some advanced candlestick patterns. First on our radar is the bearish piercing line pattern. This two candle pattern forms when, after a gap up from the close following the original green candle, the second candle closes red and below the 50% level of the preceding bullish candle. This pattern is not as pronounced as the bearish engulfing candle, however, 
as the body of the second candle does not fully encompass the candle that precedes it. Because of this, one ought to regard this piercing pattern with a degree of caution. Whereas an engulfing candle demonstrates that sellers are clearly strong, the reliability of this piercing pattern signaling reversal depends upon other factors, especially volume. Be that as it may, because the sellers in the second candle were able to erase over half the buyer's efforts from the previous candle, this pattern can, when it appears at the top of an uptrend, signal possible trend reversal. Even though buyers were strong, sellers were able to pause the uptrend and put on a display of strength. Similar bearish strength is seen in the three black crows pattern. The three black crows pattern consists of three consecutive red candles, all relatively long in size, that close lower than the previous candle. As an aside, uh, the name originates uh, from those who use black bodied candlesticks for bearish candles. Anyways, technically speaking, the pattern requires that each of the subsequent red candles opens inside the body of the previous session's candle. But we can show some flexibility here. Remember, this is an art rather than a science. When this pattern forms at the top of an uptrend, the length of these three consecutive red candles indicates that sellers have stepped in with strength. The price increase from the previous uptrend is being erased and bears are starting to become confident. This inverted V-shaped top is relatively rare, however, as most breakdown attempts are followed by a retest. It is therefore ill-advised to chase with a bearish trade near the bottom of the third red candle. Consolidation and or a healthy bounce are often required for further continuation to the downside. Unlike the previous reversal patterns, the falling three method is a continuation pattern. When it appears during a falling downtrend, for example, the presence of three small bodied candles in a bounce suggests that further downside is possible. The relative inability of buyers to drastically push the price of the security up indicates that sellers have the ability to retake control and continue the downtrend. This pattern will become even more important when we consider Fibonacci retracement levels, volume, and more later on in the course. For now, the important thing to note is that three small bullish candles following a large red candle suggests that the decline is not yet over. Be careful though, because three large green candles following a downtrend is actually a bullish pattern, the three white soldiers pattern that we discussed above. Next up is the bearish Harami, which is a two candle pattern that forms when a smaller red candle is inside the range of the body of the green candle that precedes it. This inside bar pattern is typically bearish as sellers were able to consolidate price action, theoretically bringing the uptrend to completion. As with all patterns, volume is particularly important here as we shall see more fully later in the course. Finally, let's consider the bearish island reversal pattern. A bearish island reversal pattern forms when there is a gap up to a series of candles followed by a gap down in price. These islands typically form when a trend is in its final stages, one final move that causes maximum pain for those who have been trying to play a potential reversal. It's important to wait for confirmation before entering, however, as not every gap up in price should be construed as an island in the making. Further upside cannot be ruled out. That is why it is safer to wait for reversal to confirm prior to going short on the underlying security. Well, there you have it. 10 more candlestick patterns that you now have in your toolkit. These patterns and more are helpfully summarized in the candlestick cheat sheet pictured below. One of the most basic, but also one of the most important aspects of technical analysis is the ability to identify support and resistance levels on your chart. The more time that you spend following price action across various indexes, stocks, and securities, the more you will realize just how important support and resistance levels are for making informed decisions when trading. Consider the image on the right. Even without knowing the name of the security or its current price, this chart shows a ranging price action that is bouncing off resistance near the top and support near the bottom. 
buyer exhaustion occurs as resistance approaches and then sellers take over. Seller exhaustion occurs as support approaches and then buyers take over. And the pattern repeats on multiple occasions. With a security that ranges like this, going long at support is a relatively safe strategy, so long as support holds. If it does, then you ride the trend up toward resistance, sliding your profit-taking stop loss higher along the way. If it does not, then you acknowledge that the trade setup has failed, and you exit the trade for a small loss. Price action is almost never this perfect, however. Very often, there will be fake-out breakdowns below support that buyers immediately buy up, just as there is occasionally fake-out breakouts above resistance that sellers immediately invalidate. The support and resistance lines on your chart should therefore be thought of less as hard and fast levels and more as flexible ranges that are important to be aware of. The next point to recognize about support and resistance levels is that resistance can turn into support and vice versa. If buyers successfully push the price above a key resistance level and they are able to hold those gains, prior resistance becomes potential support. It is important, however, that you wait for confirmation of previous resistance turning into support before entering a bullish trade. Without waiting for a retest of prior resistance, a bullish entry during a breakout could end up being nothing more than chasing a play at the top. You do not know if prior resistance will now function as support, and as such, you should exude caution before assuming that the uptrend will continue. The same ought to be said about breakdowns in price. In this image on the right, we see the price breaking down below support. The brief bounce back up toward the prior support level was met with selling pressure, turning previous support into current resistance. The question then is how do we identify support and resistance levels, and on what time frames should we be looking? Click on the following link and watch the video before proceeding to the next slide. All right, now that we are familiar with basic support and resistance, we can turn our attention toward identifying trends, channels, and drawing trend lines. You will often hear traders saying that you should not fight the trend. Well, what are they talking about? In the market, there are two primary trends that you need to be aware of, the uptrend and the downtrend. In an uptrend, the market is characterized by an increase in price, which results in a series of higher highs and higher lows. As buyers continue to turn previous resistance into current support, the price of the underlying security rises. In a downtrend, the opposite is the case. Here we see a decline in price, resulting in a series of lower lows and lower highs. Sellers are in control as they turn previous support levels into current resistance. Determining what trend we are in across various timeframes is vital. In general, the trend on longer time frames, such as the daily or the weekly charts, is more important than the trend on the one minute or the five minute time frame. But this depends. If you are an intraday trader, you might not care if the long term trend is up, if the intraday trend is down. That said, the longer term trend is still helpful information to have, as it could signal the possibility that the intraday downtrend could soon reverse as bulls attempt to keep the longer term uptrend continuing. At any rate, these uptrends and downtrends commonly form what is known as a channel within which price action trades. In this image, we see not only an uptrend, but we also see a very clearly defined channel. This channel is composed of trendline resistance and trendline support. Typically, in order for a trendline to be valid, you would want to have at least three points on the chart where price action makes contact with the trend. We see this here on both the trend line support and the trend line resistance, confirming the trend lines is valid. Yet again, however, these trend lines on your charts should be thought of less as hard and fast levels and more as flexible ranges that are important to be aware of. Wicks below support and above resistance are very common and do not always indicate that a breakdown and or a breakout is imminent. Uh, to see how all of this looks in practice, watch the following video before proceeding to the next slide. One mistake that traders occasionally make 
comes by prioritizing trend line breaches over basic support and resistance. While it is important to notice when price action breaks outside of a channel, either by breaking through trend line resistance or breaking down through trend line support, this does not necessarily mean that a larger reversal is imminent. As a trader, you need to be able to hold together channels and trend lines on the one hand and basic support and resistance on the other. It is always possible for price to break down through a trend line only to immediately bounce off of one of your horizontal support levels. Likewise, for attempted trend line breakouts and horizontal resistance levels. Another mistake that traders occasionally make comes by assuming that there are only uptrends and downtrends. There are also sideways trends, a ranging market. If you have spent any time watching live charts, you will have noticed days where price action trades relatively flat, what traders often refer to as chop. During these choppy market conditions, price action will often trade outside of previous channels and trend lines, but it will do so in such a way that reversal does not take place. This occasionally happens on low volume days, but it also frequently happens at the top of uptrends and the bottom of downtrends. Instead of an uptrend immediately converting into a downtrend, a sideways trend is often required, a period of distribution where the smart money sells their shares and the late money inadvertently buys the top. Likewise, for downtrends, instead of an immediate transition from a price decline to an uptrend, there is often a period of accumulation where the smart money uh, buys shares and the scared or impatient trader inadvertently sells the bottom. We'll say more about distribution and accumulation in due course, but it suffices it here to note that not all trendline breaches signify reversal. Early bulls and bears often underestimate the potential for how long markets can trade sideways before reversal takes place. That being said, when reversal does take place, what levels should we look out for? How far might price pull back after an uptrend? Or how far might price rally after a downtrend? In order to answer this question, we need to consider Fibonacci retracement levels. While we do not need to give an in-depth history of Fibonacci levels, the ideas behind them date back to an 11th century mathematician. Proponents of Fibonacci levels argue that these numbers are found all over nature and are embedded within the very fabric of the universe. From the shape of a snail's shell to the number of petals on a flower, the Fibonacci sequence is everywhere. At some point, people put two and two together. Yet the Fibonacci sequence occurs in nature, why wouldn't it also occur in the stock market? Whether or not you are a fan of using Fibonacci levels, the market itself is a reflection of human psychology. And if enough people believe in these Fibonacci levels, and it is widespread enough to the point that we can safely assume that they do, then the, these will very likely be important levels to be familiar with on your charts. Again, you don't have to buy into some theory about the cosmos in order to admit that price action is determined by human beliefs and emotions. And if enough people orient their trading around the Fibonacci sequence, then you better familiarize yourself with how it works. Anyways, the framework works like this. The 11th century mathematician came up with a sequence in which the next number will always result from adding together the previous two numbers in the sequence. When you begin with one, it goes something like this. You have one. 1 plus 0 equals 1, so you add 1 onto that. 1 plus 1 equals 2, now you have 1, 1, 2. 2 plus 1 equals 3, so you have 1, 1, 2, 3. 3 plus 2 equals 5, so you add the 5, etc., etc., etc. So you have 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, etc. Interestingly, these numbers bear striking relationships to one another. For example, once we get past the number 1, any number divided by the next number in the sequence, for example, 5 divided by 8, will tend toward 0 0.618. The further that you go in the sequence, the closer and closer that you will get to 0 0.618 as the result. What's more, if you take any number in the sequence and divide it by the number that is two positions to its right, 
So for example, 5 divided by 13 will tend ever closer toward 0 0.382. Continuing along, taking any number in the sequence and dividing it by the number that is three positions to its right, for example, 5 divided by 21 will tend ever closer toward 0 0.236. And of course, 1 divided by 2 is 0 0.5. So we have 0 0.236, 0 0.382, 0 0.5, 0 0.618, and amongst others, such as the 0 0.786. But these are the main ones. What technical analysts do is convert these to percentages, multiplying the decimal by 100. So 23.6%, 38.2%, 50%, 61.8%, and 78.6%. When looking for potential retracement levels, then, the technical analyst will add these targets to their chart. After an uptrend is put in, a 23.6% 23.6% or 38.2% retracement are common targets. Likewise, for after a downtrend is completed, a 23.6% or 38.2% recovery of the price decline are commonly expected. If a genuine trend reversal is underway, rather than just a mild retracement, that is when the 0 0.618 and 0 0.786 levels come into play. So let's see how this works in practice. Click on the link below and watch the video before proceeding to the next slide. Not only do technical analysts use the Fibonacci sequence to forecast retracement levels, but they also use it to forecast continuation targets. In other words, whereas FIB retracement levels are used to identify levels that the price may test when moving against the trend, FIB extension levels are used to identify levels that the price may test when continuing with the trend after the counter trend movement completes. Make sure to watch the following video before proceeding to the next slide. Earlier in the course, we considered some basic and advanced candlestick patterns that are composed of roughly one to three candles. While that information is helpful, what is perhaps even more important to be familiar with is chart patterns that form against several, perhaps even dozens of candles, depending on the time frame. Unlike potential candlestick patterns that can quickly be invalidated by the next couple candles, the benefit of these chart patterns is that they form over time and can signal high quality setups whether that be a continuation pattern or a reversal pattern. Before actually discussing some of these chart patterns though, let's think about this for a moment. Let's assume for the sake of argument that we are on the one hour time frame and we spot what looks like a shooting star, a bearish candlestick pattern. Recognizing this candlestick pattern, some people might attempt to short the stock or buy put contracts, betting on reversal. But what if the shooting star was an anomaly what if it was caused by a news catalyst that brought down the entire market during that time? What if it was low volume selling pressure that created the upper wick? And perhaps most importantly, what if we are in the middle of a larger chart pattern that points toward bullish continuation to the upside? One single candle on the one hour time frame should not be determinative of your trading strategy. Always seek confirmation in consultation with the topics that we have discussed previously, including support, resistance, trend lines, and FIB levels, as well as the chart patterns that we will discuss in a moment. In order to properly execute a trade, you need to be able to identify whether the current chart pattern is signaling a continuation of the prevailing trend or if it is signaling potential reversal. These two pattern types are antithetical to one another, and so an awareness of their characteristic features and differences is important. At its core, a continuation pattern suggests that it is more likely than not that the dominant trend will continue in the same direction. In other words, rather than a trend being broken and a new trend being formed, a continuation pattern suggests that the current market direction will persist, at least for some time. If we are in an uptrend, making higher highs and higher lows, a continuation pattern is bullish. We are likely to continue higher. If we are in a downtrend, making lower highs and lower lows, a continuation pattern is bearish. We are likely to continue moving lower. In short, if the bulls have been winning, it looks like they will continue to win, and vice versa for the bears. 
while we will discuss the specific patterns below, it suffices it here to note that these continuation patterns are best understood as a temporary pause or consolidation period in the trend. It is important to note, however, that not every continuation pattern will successfully play out. A bullish continuation pattern is confirmed only if the price of the underlying security breaks above the consolidation level with an impulse wave higher. Likewise, a bearish continuation pattern is confirmed only if the price breaks below the consolidation level with an impulse wave lower. But you should always be cautious. There are occasionally fake out breakouts and or breakdowns after a continuation pattern that initially appear to confirm continuation but are quickly rejected. As such, not every attempted breakout after a bullish continuation pattern will continue making higher highs and higher lows, and not every attempted breakdown after a bearish continuation pattern will continue making lower highs and lower lows. Bearing this in mind, if you think that you have spotted a continuation pattern, make sure you have three points of confirmation. One, a strong preceding trend. Two, a temporary consolidation phase. And three, a confirmed breakout. These three features, as we will discuss later in the course, are absolutely vital for determining your entry, profit-taking targets, and stop-loss levels. A reversal pattern, by contrast, suggests that it is more likely than not that the dominant trend will end and soon change direction. In other words, rather than a trend continuing, a reversal pattern suggests that a new trend will be formed. If we are in an uptrend, making higher highs and higher lows, a reversal pattern is bearish. We are likely to reverse and move lower. If we are in a downtrend, making lower highs and lower lows, a reversal pattern is bullish. We are likely to reverse and move higher. In short, if the bulls have been winning, it looks like they will start to lose, and vice versa for the bears. It is important to note, however, that not every reversal pattern will successfully play out. A bullish reversal pattern is confirmed only if the price of the underlying security breaks above the consolidation level with an impulse wave higher. Likewise, a bearish reversal pattern is confirmed only if the price breaks below the consolidation level with an impulse wave lower. Consequently, if you think you have spotted a reversal pattern, make sure you have the three points of confirmation that we just mentioned, a strong preceding trend, temporary consolidation, and a confirmed breakdown. These three features will help you determine where to enter, where to take profit, and where to set your stop loss. Now that we know the difference between a continuation pattern and a reversal pattern, let's start to discuss some examples, beginning with bullish continuation patterns. So what sorts of consolidation patterns have the best chances of signaling bullish continuation? One of the most common patterns is known as the bull flag that occurs during an uptrend. The bull flag has two key features. One, a long flagpole formed during an uptrend, and two, a flag composed of roughly two parallel descending lines that act as support and resistance. Ideally, the flagpole will be very steep, forming after a strong impulse move up. The flag, meanwhile, is a short consolidation phase in which the price pulls back slightly and ranges within these two parallel descending trend lines. Those seeking to enter a bullish trade upon spotting a potential bull flag should note that the initial breakout move will typically be followed by a retest of previous resistance. If resistance turns into support, that is when a relatively low risk bullish entry becomes viable. This insight should be kept in mind for all of the patterns that we will be discussing below. The bullish falling wedge is very similar to the bull flag in that they both form during an uptrend, but there are two key differences. First, unlike the bull flag, there need not necessarily be a long flagpole prior to the formation of the falling wedge. A modest uptrend is all that is needed. Second, unlike the bull flag, the two key trend lines during the pullback in price are not parallel with one another. Rather, they converge to form a wedge that eventually meets at a single point. In practice, the price will almost never form and complete the perfect falling wedge, but the main point is that the pullback's two trend lines 
are both descending while simultaneously converging toward one another. When this pattern forms, there is a relatively high probability for continuation of the uptrend. The next pattern that we will consider is known as, as the bullish pennant. Like the bull flag, it is characterized by a long flagpole formed during a strong uptrend. Like the bullish falling wedge, however, the two trend lines are not parallel to one another, but rather converge toward a single point. The thing that sets it apart from the previous two patterns is the fact that while the upper trend line of the pullback resistance is descending, the lower trend line of the pullback support is ascending. In other words, instead of having two descending trend lines, the bullish pennant is unique in that the lower trend line ascends. As we shall see below, however, the bullish pennant is not to be confused with the symmetrical triangle, a pattern that can be either bullish or bearish. At any rate, the bullish pennant is a very common pattern that signals trend continuation to the upside, but confirmation of a breakout with volume is encouraged before trying to ride the trend. As with all the patterns being discussed in this section, the ascending triangle forms in the midst of an uptrend. Here, however, we see the price frequently running into a horizontal resistance level while making a series of higher lows during the period of consolidation. When taken together, the two trend lines of the consolidation period form a converging pattern, with the flat upper trend line eventually meeting the ascending lower trend line at resistance. While one might get the impression that the frequent number of rejections at resistance is a bearish signal, the reason that the ascending triangle pattern is typically bullish is because of the fact that a series of higher lows are formed in the attempt to bust through resistance. Buyers are not letting sellers push down the price to make lower lows, giving buyers confidence that breaching resistance and pushing higher is possible. A similar phenomenon to the above occurs in the bullish rectangle. Like the ascending triangle, the consolidation phase of the bullish rectangle is characterized by the price frequently running into a horizontal upper resistance level. Unlike the ascending triangle, however, the lower support level is parallel with the upper trend line, forming a rectangular pattern. This pattern has a very clearly defined range within which price trades before an attempted breakout occurs. Strong support is being established while the bulls gain enough momentum to break through resistance and continue the uptrend. Several traders make the mistake of seeing three local tops form in this pattern, which can occasionally be a bearish pattern, one that we will discuss below. If these three tops are formed within a rectangular consolidation period, however, the bearish thesis has less validity to it. That said, caution should be advised here. Wait for confirmation of a breakout in which the upper resistance level turns into support before entering long. Continuing our theme of patterns with a horizontal upper resistance level, we now turn to the cup and handle pattern. As the name suggests, this pattern is composed of two parts, a large U-shaped cup and a smaller handle. When this pattern forms in the midst of an uptrend, it tells us a story. Even though the price ran into strong resistance and the sellers were able to push it back down, buyers were slowly but surely able to reclaim momentum amidst a process of recovery and accumulation, pushing price back up toward that prior resistance level. Here, however, the rejection at resistance does not pull back as far as did the cup. Buyers were stronger this time around, preventing a larger sell-off. As such, this gives bulls a great degree of confidence. Sellers are weak, and resistance can be broken. While there can be some flexibility here, typically bulls do not want the handle to retrace more than 50% of the height of the cup that precedes it. The ideal target for the handle's low is roughly the 0.382 Fib retracement level when measured from the bottom of the cup to the top of resistance. If the handle dips too low, the potential setup can be invalidated and a bearish double top pattern can come into play. 
All right, folks, there are six of the most common bullish continuation patterns to look out for. Let's now turn to consider some bearish continuation patterns that are the mirror image of the ones we just discussed. Our task now is to discuss the patterns that form in downtrends that signal the decline in price is not yet over. One of the most common patterns is known as the bear flag that occurs during a downtrend. The bear flag has two key features. One, a long flagpole formed during the downtrend, and two, a flag composed of two roughly parallel ascending lines that act as support and resistance. Ideally, the flagpole will be very steep, forming after a strong impulse move down. The flag, meanwhile, is a short consolidation phase in which the price bounces higher slightly and ranges within these two parallel ascending trend lines. Those seeking to enter a bearish trade upon spotting a potential bear flag should note that the initial breakdown move will typically be followed by a retest of previous support. If previous support turns into resistance, that is when a relatively low risk bearish entry becomes viable. This insight should be kept in mind for all of the patterns that we will be discussing on the next page. The bearish rising wedge is very similar to the bear flag in that both form during a downtrend, but there are two key differences. First, unlike the bear flag, there need not necessarily be a long flagpole prior to the formation of the rising wedge. A modest downtrend is all that is needed. Second, unlike the bear flag, the two key trend lines during the pullback in price are not parallel with one another. Rather, they converge to form a wedge that eventually meets at a single point. In practice, the price will almost never form or complete a perfect rising wedge, but the main point is that the two trend lines are both ascending while simultaneously converging toward one another. When this pattern forms, there is a relatively high probability for continuation of the downtrend. The next pattern that we will consider is known as the bearish pennant. Like the bear flag, it is characterized by a long flagpole formed during a strong downtrend. Like the bearish rising wedge, however, the two trend lines are not parallel to one another, but rather converge toward a single point. The thing that sets it apart from the previous two patterns is the fact that while the lower trend line support is ascending, the upper trend line resistance is actually descending. In other words, Instead of having two ascending trend lines, the bearish pennant is unique in that the upper trend line descends. As we shall see below, however, the bearish pennant is not to be confused with the symmetrical triangle, a pattern that can be either bullish or bearish. At any rate, the bearish pennant is a very common pattern that signals trend continuation to the downside, but confirmation of a breakdown with volume is encouraged before trying to ride the trend. As with all the patterns being discussed in this section, the descending triangle forms in the midst of a downtrend. Here, however, we see the price frequently running into a horizontal support level while making a series of lower highs during the period of consolidation. When taken together, the two trend lines of the consolidation period form a converging pattern with the flat lower trend line eventually meeting the descending upper trend line at support. While one might get the impression that the frequent number of bounces off support is a bullish signal, the reason that the descending triangle pattern is typically bearish is because of the fact that a series of lower highs are formed in the attempt to bust through support. Sellers are not let letting buyers push the price higher to make higher highs thus giving sellers confidence that breaching support and pushing lower is possible. Like the descending triangle, the consolidation phase of the bearish rectangle is characterized by the price frequently running into a horizontal lower support level. Unlike the descending triangle, however, the upper resistance level is parallel with the lower trend line, forming a rectangular pattern. This pattern has a very clearly defined range within which price trades before an attempted breakdown occurs. Strong resistance is being established, 
while the bears gain enough momentum to break through support and continue the downtrend. Several traders make the mistake of seeing three local bottoms form in this pattern, which can occasionally be a bullish pattern, one that we will discuss below. If these three bottoms are formed within a rectangular consolidation period, however, the bullish thesis has less validity to it. That said, caution should be advised here. Wait for confirmation of a breakdown in which the lower support level turns into resistance before entering short. Continuing our theme of patterns with a horizontal lower resistance level, we now turn to the inverse cup and handle pattern. As the name suggests, this pattern is composed of two parts, a larger inverted U-shaped cup and a smaller inverted handle. When this pattern forms in the midst of a downtrend, it tells us a story. Even though the price ran into strong support and the buyers were able to push it back up, sellers were slowly but surely able to reclaim momentum amidst a process of recovery and distribution, pushing price back down toward that prior support level. Here, however, the bounce at support does not go as high as did the inverted cup. Sellers were stronger this time, preventing a larger bounce. As such, this gives bears a great degree of confidence. Buyers are weak and support can be broken. While there can be some flexibility here, Typically, bears do not want the handle to retrace more than 50% of the height of the inverted cup that precedes it. The ideal target for the handle's high is roughly the 0.382 Fib retracement level when measured from the top of the inverted cup to the bottom of support. If the handle bounces too high, the potential setup can be invalidated and a bullish double bottom can come into play. All right, folks, now that we have covered bullish and bearish continuation patterns, let's check out some patterns that signal trend reversal. As the name suggests, the double bottom pattern is a bullish reversal pattern in which price finds support twice at recent lows after a downtrend. In an ideal setting, the two local lows would be at roughly the same price, but more often than not, the second low on the right actually dips lower than the previous low on the left. In the business, this is referred to as a stop-loss raid, where early bulls get spooked by the lower low in price action and cut their position right before the market rallies to the upside. Occasionally, this pattern is referred to as a bullish W pattern, with the cautious entry taking place at the neckline breach. The aggressive entry would take place once we reclaim the previous lows after the stop loss raid, but be careful. Keep your own stop loss tight if entering long at that aggressive entry level. Much like the double bottom, the triple bottom occurs in a downtrend where price continuously finds support at the same level. When support is touched three separate times and it holds afterwards, this is a bullish indication of potential reversal. As with the double bottom though, playing the triple bottom requires patience. The safest entry comes when the neckline resistance gets broken. Entries before then should be viewed with caution as the pattern that looks like a triple bottom can occasionally end up being a bearish rectangle continuation pattern. A pattern that is very similar to the triple bottom is known as the inverse head and shoulders pattern. Like the triple bottom, the inverse head and shoulders pattern is characterized by three local lows in price action. Unlike the triple bottom, however, the three local lows are not at the exact same level. On the contrary, the second local low dips lower than the other two, forming the inverse head, which is surrounded by two inverse shoulders on both sides. When this pattern appears at the bottom of a downtrend, it is typically regarded as bullish. This is because the right shoulder makes a higher low, indicating that sellers are weak, buyers are strong, and neckline resistance is vulnerable if buyer volume appears. But as with most attempted breakouts, it is important to wait for the retest of that previous neckline resistance before entering long. Unlike the inverse head and shoulders pattern, 
the saucer bottom or rounded bottom is defined not by a series of three lows, but rather by the rounded nature of the price action. When a rounded bottom pattern like this appears at the bottom of a downtrend, it signals that buyers are slowly but surely taking over control. Sellers are less and less dominant as the price slowly begins to curl to the upside. When the saucer completes and meets previous resistance, there is very often a brief pullback before an attempted breakout. When the previous resistance turns into current support, that is when the saucer bottom is confirmed and trend reversal is at hand. The final bullish pattern that we will consider is known as the falling wedge. The falling wedge pattern in the midst of a downtrend appears when trendline resistance and trendline support, both of which are descending in direction, converge toward one another, theoretically meeting at a single point. The tighter that price coils within this wedge, the bigger the anticipated move to the upside. The pattern is typically bullish because even though sellers are winning the battle on the downtrend, buyers are slowly accumulating shares, preparing for an attempted breakout and trend reversal. Do note, however, that these falling wedges can last far longer than you might initially be inclined to suppose, and there are occasionally stop-loss raids to the downside prior to the actual breakout. As always, patience is incredibly important when playing trend reversals. Now let's consider some bearish reversal patterns, and let's begin with a basic reversal pattern known as the double top. As the name suggests, the double top pattern is a bearish reversal pattern in which price finds resistance twice at recent highs after an uptrend. In an ideal setting, the two local tops would be at roughly the same price, but more often than not, the second top on the right actually pushes higher than the previous top on the left. In the business, this is referred to as a stop-loss raid, where early bears get spooked by the higher high in price action and cut their position right before the market sells off to the downside. Occasionally, this pattern is referred to as a bearish M pattern, with the cautious entry taking place at the neckline breach. The aggressive entry would take place once we reclaim the break below the stop-loss raid. But be careful here. Keep your own stop loss tight if entering short at that level. Much like the double top, the triple top occurs in an uptrend, where price continuously finds resistance at the same level. When resistance is touched three separate times, and if it holds afterwards, this is a bearish indication of potential reversal. Now as with the double top though, playing the triple top requires patience. The safest entry comes when the neckline support gets broken. Entries before then should be viewed with caution, as the pattern that looks like a triple top reversal can occasionally end up being a bullish rectangle continuation pattern that we discussed earlier. Like the triple top, the head and shoulders pattern is characterized by three local tops in price action. Unlike the triple top pattern, however, the three local tops here are not the exact same level. On the contrary, the second local top pushes higher than the other two, forming the head, which is surrounded by a shoulder on both sides. When this pattern appears at the top of an uptrend, it is typically regarded as bearish. This is because the right shoulder makes a lower high than the head, indicating that buyers are weak, sellers are strong, and neckline support is vulnerable if seller volume appears. But as with most attempted breakdowns, it is important to wait for the retest of the previous neckline support before entering short. Unlike the head and shoulders pattern, the saucer top or rounded top is defined not by a series of three highs, but rather by the rounded nature of the price action. When a rounded top pattern like this appears at the top of an uptrend, it signals that sellers are slowly but surely taking over control. Buyers are less and less dominant as the price slowly begins to curl to the downside. When the saucer completes and meets previous support, there is very often a brief bounce before an attempted breakdown. When the previous support turns into current resistance, that is when the saucer top is confirmed and a trend reversal is at hand. The final bearish reversal pattern that we will consider is known as the rising wedge. The rising wedge pattern in the midst of an uptrend appears when trendline resistance and trendline support 
both of which are ascending in direction, converge toward one another, theoretically meeting at a single point. The tighter that price coils within this wedge, the bigger the anticipated move to the downside. The pattern is typically bearish because even though buyers are winning the battle on the uptrend, sellers are slowly distributing shares, preparing for an attempted breakdown and trend reversal. Do note, however, that these rising wedges can last far longer than you might initially be inclined to suppose, and there are occasionally stop-loss rates to the upside prior to the actual breakdown. As always, patience is incredibly important when playing trend reversals. Well, there you have it, folks. We have now covered bullish continuation and reversal patterns along with bearish continuation and reversal patterns. The next thing to consider is bidirectional chart patterns that could theoretically play out in either direction. The main bidirectional chart pattern to look out for is known as a symmetrical triangle, a pattern that can form at the top of an uptrend or the bottom of a downtrend, or even in a sideways trend. Even in and of itself, the symmetrical triangle is a neutral pattern in that it could theoretically break out to the upside or break down and sell off. These patterns can form over a long period of time and as such are great setups for a big move up or down. As with most movements in price action, however, do make sure to watch out for fake outs in either direction. Keep your initial entries light and your stop losses tight. There are two key differences between the symmetrical triangle and the pennants mentioned above. Whereas the pennants have a long flagpole preceding them, this is not the case for the symmetrical triangle. And whereas the pennants are characterized by a brief period of consolidation before continuation, the symmetrical triangle often forms over a long period of time. The next two bidirectional chart patterns have already been discussed above, but they are included here because they can occasionally play out in either direction. The first is the ascending triangle. Earlier, we presented the ascending triangle as a bullish pattern, and for good reason. Most of the time, ascending triangles end up continuing to the upside during an uptrend. That being said, occasionally they act like a rising wedge and can therefore turn bearish. Mentioning this possibility here is simply a friendly reminder that no chart pattern is guaranteed to play out in your favor, and especially so with the ascending triangle. Likewise, for the descending triangle. We previously presented the descending triangle as a bearish pattern and with justification. Most of the time, descending triangles end up continuing to the downside during a downtrend. That being said, occasionally they act like a falling wedge and can therefore turn bullish. We mentioned this possibility here to make sure that you stay alert to the possibility that this pattern could go either way. All right, then, that is enough about chart patterns for now. Next on our list is a discussion of some key levels to be aware of on your charts. The first on our list is price gaps. So what is a price gap? For the sake of this discussion, let's use the daily time frame on candlestick charts. Simply put, a price gap occurs whenever there is absolutely no overlap between one candle and the next, including the wicks. In the example pictured on the top right, the price gap is referred to as a gap up because there is a gap above the preceding candle and below the subsequent candle. In the overnight price action, buyers pushed the price higher and we opened the next day far above the high of the previous day. In the example on the bottom right, by contrast, the price gap is referred to as a gap down because there is a gap below the preceding candle and above the subsequent candle. In the overnight price action, sellers pushed the price lower and we opened the next day far below the previous day's low. Now there are several reasons why a gap might form, whether that be global news, a company earnings update, a merger, etc. But we do not need a major catalyst for a gap to occur due to the fact that there is often low liquidity in the overnight trading session, it is far easier to move and manipulate the price of the underlying security. That being said, 
Not all gaps are created equal. In fact, technical analysts commonly identify four different types of price gaps. One, breakaway gaps, two, runaway gaps, three, exhaustion gaps, and four, common gaps. Let's begin with the breakaway gap. This type of gap occurs when the price of an underlying security gaps above resistance to begin a move up or below support to begin a move down. In other words, it is a breakout or breakdown pattern, but the actual breach of support or resistance occurs in the form of a gap. Due to the fact that this gap signals strong momentum in a new direction, the initial breakaway gap often does not get filled before continuing, either higher or lower. Waiting for a breakaway gap to be filled before entering into a position is thus a strategy that does not always work. In fact, as price continues higher or lower, people often experience regret that they did not enter sooner and therefore decide that now is the time to enter. When this happens, you will occasionally encounter a runaway gap. During an uptrend, a runaway gap suggests that buyers who did not enter at the start of the breakout are late to the party, and they fear that no pullback will present itself for a cheaper entry. This results in a massive increase in buying interest, which, when it occurs in the overnight session, results in a gap up in price. Oftentimes, this spike in interest is caused by an important news catalyst, which gives smart investors the impression that it is now or never if they want to get into this position. During a downtrend, however, a runaway gap suggests that sellers who did not execute at the start of the breakdown are late, and they fear that no retest will present itself either to either exit their long positions or to enter short. This results in a massive increase in selling interest, which, when it occurs in the overnight session, results in a gap down in price. Yet again, this spike in selling interest is often caused by an important news catalyst, which gives smart investors the impression that it is now or never if they want to sell their shares or go short on the underlying security. Occasionally, runaway gaps get filled before the trend continues, but not always. Don't be surprised if it takes quite some time before this price gap gets closed on the chart. The next type of gap, however, is often a trap. It is known as an exhaustion gap. These gaps form near the top of an uptrend and near the bottom of a downtrend. In order to determine whether we are witnessing a runaway gap or an exhaustion gap, it's important to look at the candles that follow. All right, so you have to wait. If we start to see reversal candlestick patterns, like dojis, shooting stars, per hammers, after that gap, then there is a very good chance that it is an exhaustion gap and that the current trend is coming to completion soon. Late bulls often get trapped here at the top of an uptrend, along with late bears at the bottom of a downtrend. What they think is a runaway pattern ends up being trend exhaustion and then they get stuck holding the bag. Finally, let's consider common gaps. Common gaps occur in ranging markets when there is no clear trend and do not necessarily indicate an impending shift to the upside or to the downside. Very frequently, these gaps get filled in the short term, though not always. The main difference between a common gap and a breakaway gap is whether or not the gap crosses a key support or resistance level. If it doesn't, then it's a common gap. If it does, then it could be an attempted breakaway. So by way of summary, common gaps often get filled quickly, but don't enter a reversal trade as soon as you spot one. Breakaway gaps often do not get filled right away as they indicate strong momentum with the establishment of a new trend. Runaway gaps can occasionally get filled before the trend continues, but momentum is strong and the gap fill is not guaranteed. And exhaustion gaps signal the end of the current trend is coming soon and that trend reversal is on the horizon. These gaps often get filled relatively quickly, which leads to the possibility that the unfilled runaway and breakaway gaps could get filled over time. Determining what kind of price gap you are looking at is therefore of the utmost importance when you are trading the underlying security. 
The next levels to be familiar with on your charts are the highs and lows in price action from the previous trading day and the previous trading week. These levels are particularly important pivot points and often act as key support and resistance levels for intraday traders. Here is an example with Bitcoin. Apart from the, pack, the fact that these levels are important for intraday traders, they are also important to determine the current trend and potential trend reversal. For example, if we are currently in an uptrend, a daily close below the previous day's low could signal trend reversal. Vice versa for a downtrend, a daily close above the previous day's high is frequently an indication that trend reversal could be on the horizon. This is even more important on the weekly time frame. Closing above the previous week's high after a downtrend is a strong bullish indicator, just like closing below the previous week's low after an uptrend is a strong bearish indicator. For those who use TradingView, we have a special indicator built by one of our members that is linked in our Discord. Make sure to have these levels on your charts, whether you are a swing trader or an intraday trader. The final key levels to be aware of apply primarily to intraday traders, the opening range. Individual traders have different preferences as to the duration of the opening range, but the common time frames are 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and occasionally the one hour. The top of the opening range is identified by the highest the price of the underlying security traded during the chosen time frame, whereas the bottom of the opening range is identified by the lowest the price traded during that time. This range in price action is key information for an intraday trader, as a break above the opening range is typically bullish for the short term, and a break below the opening range is typically bearish for the short term. Occasionally, the day's trend is established once the opening range is breached, though not always. Not only are there fake out breakouts and breakdowns, but there are times where price action will trade above and below the opening range multiple times throughout the same trading day. That being said, these opening range breakouts offer great opportunities for intraday traders who are patient and wait for confirmation of a breach of this ranging price action. When used in conjunction with other support and resistance levels, trend lines, and Fibonacci levels, ideal price targets can be identified when the opening range is breached. Do note, however, that these trades typically do not last very long, and profits should be taken when price begins to consolidate after breaching the opening range. If you are an intraday trader, make sure that you have this indicator on your charts. Turning ahead, let's consider moving averages. In the world of statistics, a moving average is a mathematical calculation that is used to assess various data points in order to create a series of plotted averages over time. In the world of the stock market, these moving averages are used as a vital component of technical analysis. Without going into great detail about the calculations, the moving average is essentially the average price over a select time frame. If you are on the daily chart, for example, the 50-day moving average is calculated by analyzing the average price over the course of the previous 50 days. Likewise, for the 200-day moving average, you take the 200 previous daily candles and calculate the average price, an average that moves with the price action of each passing day. When the price of an underlying security is in a strong uptrend, shorter-term moving averages will be above longer term moving averages, as seen in this image here. When the price of an underlying security is in a strong downtrend, however, shorter term moving averages will be below longer term moving averages, as seen in the lower image. Because of this general principle, several traders regard a crossover of certain moving averages to indicate either bullish or bearish sentiment. For example, if the 200 moving average were to cross above the 50 moving average after a lengthy bull rally, this can signal that bearish conditions may persist for some time. The market is trending down 
and it may continue to do so. If the 200 MA were to cross below the 50 MA after a lengthy bear market, however, this can signal that bullish conditions may be on the horizon. The market is trending up, and the relationship between these two moving averages suggests that it will continue to do so. It is important to note, however, that the moving averages are dependent upon the selected time frame. If you are on the five minute chart, for instance, the 50 MA is calculated not by the average over the last 50 days, but rather by the average of the last 50 five minute candles. In other words, the 50 MA can be calculated on any time frame, be that the one minute, the five minute, 15, 30, one hour, four hour, one day, one week, or one month, etc. The value of the 50 MA will be unique for all of these different time frames, as the average price over the past 50 weeks is theoretically going to be very different than the average price over the past 50 minutes. Of course, the 50 MA on the one minute time frame is not going to be very relevant to someone who is looking to hold their position for weeks, months, or years. But it would be very relevant information to someone who is an intraday trader attempting to analyze the day's trend. Similarly, the 50 MA on the one week time frame is not going to be very relevant to an intraday trader, but it is very relevant for the swing trader and the long term investor. At any rate, Certain moving averages are regarded as key levels of potential support or resistance, whether we are in an uptrend or a downtrend. Some of these popular moving averages include the 5, 8, 9, 13, 21, 34, 50, 72, 89, 180, and 200. And of course, there are others as well, you know, nice round numbers like the 100, the 150, the 250, etc. That being said, there is nothing magical about these numbers. You could easily add one to each and use 6, 9, 10, 14, 22, 35, 51, 73, 90, 181, and 201 and get very similar information. The important thing is to understand the relationship between shorter and longer term moving averages and what that relationship indicates about the current price action and potential future trends. But this brings us to an important topic. How do we decide what kind of moving average to use? For example, of the two major kinds of moving averages, the simple moving average and the exponential moving average, which one should be on our charts? The answer to this question is not so straightforward. It depends on what you're looking for. The simple moving average, or the SMA, allocates equal weighting to every data point on the chosen time frame. The average is thus relatively straightforward to calculate. The EMA, or the exponential moving average, allocates higher weighting to recent data over older data, and thus is more reactive to the latest changes in price. In my experience, I've found that traders typically prefer the EMA over the SMA but when it comes down to it, they are typically very close to one another in value, often pennies apart. I am not one of those who has a strong opinion on this subject, given that I am primarily an intraday trader, but long-term investors and swing traders will notice that the values can differ by a few dollars on longer time frames, And so the distinction between the two can make a difference. Whatever the case may be, just remember that the key difference between the two is that the exponential moving average is weighted toward recent price action, whereas the simple moving average alloca allocates equal weight toward all of the relevant data points. One of the more creative ways to visualize moving averages is known as the EMA clouds. Although the clouds might appear to be complex, they ultimately provide us with the exact same information as basic EMAs. The difference is in the visual presentation. Take, for example, the 34 EMA and the 50 EMA. When plotted on a chart normally, they would look like the lower image. When plotted as an EMA cloud, however, it looks like the image on top. In short, the EMA cloud is created by taking a shorter term and a longer term EMA, plotting them on the chart, and filling the space in between with a semi-transparent color 
creating the cloud. The customizable nature of this procedure is such that you can make the cloud's color change if there is a crossover of the two EMAs. If the 34 EMA flips below the 50 EMA, for example, that could signal bearish price action will persist. For visual learners, the change in the cloud's color will make this apparent. There has been a crossover of two key EMAs, as depicted in the lower image. Personally, I use the Ripster EMA clouds on TradingView, which identify the following EMA clouds. The 5 and the 13, the 8 and the 9, the 34 and the 50, the 72 and the 89, and the 180 and the 200. The visual nature of these EMA clouds not only helps traders spot trend reversal easier than they otherwise might, but they can also help identify areas of potential support in an uptrend or resistance in a downtrend. So long as price is riding the waves as support, the trend is likely to continue. Pullbacks to various EMA clouds can be healthy, support can be found, and the uptrend can continue vice versa for downtrends. Learning to trade with EMA clouds will take time, however. Figuring out how price interacts with the clouds is more of an art than a science. But over time, you will in theory be able to partially anticipate future price action based upon the relationship between the candles and the EMA clouds. The important thing to remember is that EMA clouds can help not only with riding the trend, but also with identifying potential reversals in price action. Another vital piece of information comes from the indicator known as the Relative Strength Index, or RSI. Its primary use is to determine whether a stock is overbought and potentially ready for a pullback, or oversold and potentially ready to bounce, and as such is best understood as a momentum indicator with its potential values ranging from 0 to 100. 70, above, 70 and above is considered to be overbought, and 30 and below considered to be oversold. Much like moving averages, RSI is derived via a mathematical calculation. Here, however, the result is determined differently. While we do not need to go into the particulars on the math, the basic idea is that if the average increase on green candles is larger than the average decrease on red candles over a select time frame, typically the past 14 candles is how it's calculated, then this suggests strong bullish momentum. The stronger the green candles and the weaker the red candles, the higher the reading will be on RSI. If the reading gets high enough, that is in the overbought territory of 70 and above, some traders consider cutting their bullish positions to lock in profits. This does not mean that it is time to enter a bearish position, however, Stocks can remain overbought for extended periods of time, often longer than seems rational. Bearing that in mind, overbought readings on RSI alone should never be used as a justification for entering a bearish trade. It must be used in conjunction with other factors, be that candlestick patterns, chart patterns, support or resistance, or other indicators, before trying to trade a reversal. On the other hand, if the average decrease on red candles is larger than the average increase on green candles over a select time frame, again, typically the past 14 candles, then this suggests strong bearish momentum. The stronger the red candles and the weaker the green candles, the lower the reading will be on RSI. If the reading gets low enough, that is, in the oversold territory of 30 and below, some traders consider cutting their bearish position to lock in profits. This does not mean that it is time to enter a bullish position though. Stocks can remain oversold for longer than seems rational. As such, oversold readings on RSI alone should never be used as a justification for entering a bullish trade. It must be used in conjunction with other factors before trying to trade a reversal. As with moving averages, RSI can be calculated on different timeframes and the reading on a shorter time frame, for example, the five minute chart, can be drastically different than the reading on a longer time frame, for example, the daily chart. Even if we are trading in oversold territory on the five minute chart, we can still be heavily overbought on the daily chart and vice versa. One of the ways that traders use RSI to determine their trading strategies is through what is known as divergence. There are two basic types of divergence, 
both of which indicate potential reversal, bullish divergence and bearish divergence. Bullish divergence appears when, in the midst of a downtrend in price, we start to notice an uptrend in readings on RSI. In other words, whereas the price of the underlying security is making lower lows, the reading on RSI is beginning to make higher lows. This indicates that we are approaching seller exhaustion and that buyers have a chance to regain control of price action by launching a potential uptrend. Bearish divergence, by way of contrast, appears when, in the midst of an uptrend in price, we start to notice a downtrend in readings on RSI. In other words, whereas the price of the underlying security is making higher highs, the reading on RSI is beginning to make lower highs. This indicates that we are approaching buyer exhaustion and that sellers have a chance to regain control of price action by initiating a potential downtrend. When used in conjunction with the following indicator, this is very helpful information to have when planning your trades. So earlier we discussed moving averages and how they function in relation to technical analysis. This next indicator, the moving average convergence divergence indicator, I know that's a mouthful, or MACD, is based upon two specific moving averages and their relationship to one another. As mentioned previously, when a shorter term moving average crosses above a longer term moving average, this is typically regarded as bullish. Likewise, when a shorter term moving average crosses below a longer term moving average, this is typically regarded as bearish. The MACD indicator helps us visualize this principle by plotting and analyzing the relationship between the 26 candle EMA and the 12 candle EMA. The MACD, the moving average convergence divergence calculation, is calculated by subtracting the 26 candle EMA from the 12 candle EMA. All right, the result of this calculation is a numerical value. In a strong uptrend, as seen in the bottom image, the 12 candle EMA will have a value that is greater than the 26 candle EMA. And therefore, the MACD calculation will be a positive number when you subtract the 26 candle EMA, a lower value, from the 12 candle EMA, a higher value. On the other hand, in a strong downtrend, the 12 candle EMA will have a value that is lower than the 26 candle EMA, and thus the MACD calculation will be a negative number because the 26 candle EMA, when you subtract that, which has a higher value than the 12 candle EMA, when you subtract it from the 12 candle EMA's value, you will have a negative result. In an effort to help traders visualize this better, the MACD is often displayed with a histogram with the MACD calculation plotted in that image right there on the bottom in blue. Along with the MACD calculation, that blue line, there is also the MACD signal line plotted in yellow. Interestingly, the MACD signal line does not directly track any moving average of the underlying security. On the contrary, the MACD signal line is a nine candle moving average of the MACD calculation. I know that's confusing, all right? But the blue line right there, that MACD line, is the difference between the 12 candle and the 26 candle EMA. The yellow line right there is the moving average of the blue line, a nine candle moving average of the blue line. So, in other words, if you're looking at the plotted blue line on the chart, and then you calculate the previous nine candle moving average of that blue line, you have identified what is known as the MACD signal line. Now the bar graph of the histogram, all right, the red and the green bars, is calculated by subtracting the MACD signal from the MACD line. If the number is positive, so if the MACD line is above the MACD signal, and you have a positive number, it will result in a green or a light green bar on top of the midpoint of the histogram. 
if the number is negative when the MACD blue line is below the MACD signal, all right, it will result in a red or a light red bar below the midpoint of the histogram. The length of the bar is a measurement of the distance between the MACD line and the MACD signal. So when they get further from one another, the bar increases in size. When they get closer to one another, the bars decrease in size. At any rate, when the MACD line, the blue line, which again, remember, it's calculated by subtracting the 26 candle EMA from the 12 candle EMA on your charts, when that blue line crosses below the MACD signal line, which remember, that's calculated as the nine candle moving average of the MACD line itself, that blue line, then the histogram bar, the bar graph flips from green to red. This is a leading indicator of potential bearish reversal. The positive MACD calculation is now lowering in value, meaning that the uptrend is theoretically weak and it is vulnerable to a trend reversal. Now, on the other hand, when that MACD blue line crosses above the MACD signal line, then the histogram bar graph flips from red to green. Again, this is a leading indicator of potential bullish reversal. The negative MACD calculation is now gaining in value, meaning that the downtrend is theoretically weak and vulnerable to that trend reversal. Now, a few things are important to note here. First, just because the histogram flips red or green on the selected time frame, this does not mean that a trend reversal will happen immediately or even happen at all. As a relatively leading indicator, the MACD histogram can fake people out by briefly crossing over and then crossing right back, as we see in the upper image. In fact, these false positives often occur when the price of the underlying security trades sideways, or if it is ranging to form a flag, a pennant, or triangle pattern. To avoid getting faked out, you need to use this indicator in conjunction with other sources of reversal indication. Second, when the MACD line is above, so that blue line, when it's above the midpoint of the histogram, this means, remember, that the 12 candle EMA still has a higher value than the 26 candle EMA. As such, we do not yet have a complete bearish crossover on those two EMA values until the MACD blue line crosses below the midpoint of the histogram bar graph and flips negative. In other words, the histogram, those bars, can flip bearish, red, long before there is an actual 1226 EMA crossover when that blue line actually gets below the value of zero and flips negative. Third, throughout the course of trading, if you're on trading view, you will notice a change in color from green to light green and from red to light red and vice versa. What this signals to the technical analyst is that the value between the MACD signal and that MACD line is getting closer to one another. In other words, even though there is not yet a crossover on the histogram, the visual change in color lets the trader know that those two key values are converging and that a crossover on the histogram could be on the horizon. Fourth, as with RSI, you can identify bullish and bearish divergence between price action and MACD. So for example, if the MACD line makes higher lows while price action is making lower lows, that is regarded as a bullish divergence indicator. On the other hand, if the MACD line makes lower highs while price action is making higher highs, that is regarded as a bearish divergence indicator as pictured in the lower image. There is a lot more that we could say about MACD but for now, hopefully this brief introduction will help you get familiarized with this important indicator that we reference every day in the Discord. Moving ahead, it's time that we consider volume. In my judgment, 
volume is one of the most important and least utilized indicators out there. For those who know how to interpret volume, you can get a massive edge over current and future price action. So what does volume tell us? Simply put, the volume bar graph is a visual depiction of the number of shares or derivatives traded during the chosen time frame. If you are on the 15 minute time frame, the volume bars show you the quantity of shares traded in the past 15 minutes. Likewise, for the one hour, four hour, daily, weekly, and monthly timeframes, etc. As you might expect, the higher the bar, the higher the number of shares or derivatives were traded during that time. Lower bars indicate less volumes, less volume was traded in that time frame. One of the customizable features of most volume indicators is the color of the volume bar. Quite often, the color of the volume bar is designed to match the color of the candlestick that it corresponds with. So if the candlestick closes green, the volume bar associated with that candlestick will also be green. Same thing for a red candlestick. That being said, do not assume that a large volume bar that is red necessarily indicates strong selling pressure or that a large volume bar that's green indicates strong buying pressure. As we shall see below, the type of candlestick matters, especially if it has a long upper or lower wick. Knowing precisely when the volume came in is therefore important before assuming that the volume bar's color is the only information that you need to know. Bearing that in mind, some people choose to get rid of the red-green coloring on the volume bar so that they do not mistakenly assume strong buying or selling pressure based on the color alone. A uniform color for every volume bar forces the trader to actually read the volume and understand what is happening in relationship to price action. Now, without yet going into detail, we should flag here the fact that volume can indicate the strength or weakness of the current trend, it can signal continuation or reversal, and it can occasionally function as a leading indicator for future price action. But before we can understand how all of that is so, we first need to consider a related indicator known as the volume at price, VAP, or volume profile indicator. If the normal volume indicator shows you the amount of volume traded at a specific period in time, the volume at price, VAP, or volume profile indicator shows you the amount of volume traded at a specific price. In other words, instead of showing you when the volume was traded, it shows you where the volume was traded. Whereas the normal volume indicator shows vertical, bo uh, vertical bars at the bottom of your chart, corresponding with the time frames represented by each candlestick. The volume at price indicator is composed of horizontal bars on the side of your chart, corresponding with the prices at which the underlying security has traded at various points. When there is a lot of volume surrounding a particular price range, this is known as a volume shelf. These volume shelves will very often function as support and or resistance. The space between two volume shelves with little to no volume is known as a volume gap, which is not to be confused with the price gap that we discussed earlier. The volume gap identifies an area in which price moved through a region without many shares changing hands during that time. When the price begins to break above one volume shelf into a volume gap, just know that price can move through this gap very quickly up to the next volume shelf, which often functions like a magnet. Likewise, for when price begins to break below a volume shelf, in that case, support is broken and a move down is highly probable. Now that being said, other levels must be kept in mind, including basic support and resistance levels, trend lines, and Fibonacci levels. Just because we break above or below a volume shelf does not guarantee that the next volume shelf will automatically be reached. Several obstacles will no doubt exist along the way, which is why you need to have a holistic understanding of price action technical analysis, and the main indicators discussed in this course. One thing to note about volume shelves is that they often form during periods of consolidation in price action. 
And so pairing your knowledge about volume shelves with chart patterns is a great way to find multiple points of confirmation for your trade ideas. If the chart looks like a potential bull flag breakout, while price is also attempting to break above a sizable volume shelf, that could offer a low risk bullish entry. The reason that a break above a volume shelf is typically bullish, however, is because demand, aka buyers, has surpassed overhanging supply, aka sellers. When volume starts to come in during these breakout attempts, you have even more reason to believe that a bullish trend is on the short-term horizon. Conversely, the reason that a break below a volume shelf is typically bearish is because supply, aka sellers, has overcome underhanging demand aka buyers. When volume starts to come in during these breakdown attempts, you have even more reason to believe that bearish price action is on the short-term horizon. Now, by way of summary, volume at price is an indicator that helps traders identify present and potentially future support and resistance levels. Like other indicators, it can be used on multiple time frames, from the one-minute candlesticks for intraday traders to the one-week candles for swing traders and, and beyond. Whereas the basic volume bars tell us when volume was traded, the volume at price indicator tells us where that volume was traded. When these two data points are combined, you are equipped with a great deal of information to make an informed trading decision. This is especially the case when we consider an indicator that is based upon this information known as the volume weighted average price or VWAP indicator. The volume weighted average price indicator or VWAP is a moving level on a candlestick chart that traders use as a benchmark when entering, monitoring, and exiting trades. Simply put, the VWAP identifies the average price a security has traded on a specific time frame, and it is calculated by appeal not only to price, but also to volume. On this chart, VWAP appears as a simple yellow line that moves throughout the trading period. While some traders go long when the price is above the VWAP and short when the price is below VWAP, I prefer instead to regard it as a potential mean reversion indicator that could act as both a magnet and therefore temporary support or resistance. There are, however, some limitations with VWAP because of the fact that it is primarily used for intraday trading. Having it appear on your chart over longer timeframes can lead to some odd distortions, especially after gapping up or down overnight. So long as you are on shorter time frames, though, the VWAP can be a helpful piece of information to have on your chart. In fact, once mean reversion is complete, a breach above or below VWAP with volume can in fact signal that a strong impulse move up or down is on the horizon. One of the things retail traders routinely hear is the fact that financial markets are manipulated in one sense or another, whether that be by market makers, hedge funds, algorithms, or those who buy deep in the money options. This is emphatically true. You are a small fish in a big pond, and you have no say over where the current market currents will take us. The best that you can hope for is that your position isn't attempting to swim upstream, but instead rides the waves of the market manipulators. Recognizing this, volume begins to take on an exceeding level of importance. If the markets are indeed manipulated, and they most certainly are, the only way to determine whether or not the price action is legitimate is by appeal to volume. Institutional traders can hide their buys and their sells with dark pool markets. They can hide the role and the functionality of their algorithms, but they can't hide volume. Identifying anomalies in volume is therefore one of the most important things that a trader ought to be able to do. Bearing that in mind, let us consider volume price convergence and divergence. Now let's begin with convergence between price and volume. In the upper image, we see a strong impulse wave up in the price of the underlying security. Simultaneously, however, we also see an increase in volume over this period of time. Technical analysts refer to this as volume price convergence. The increasing price action is legitimate because it is being confirmed by an increase in volume. Conversely, in the lower image, we see a strong impulse wave down in the price of the underlying security. 
Yet again, we also see an increase in volume during this time. As such, the downtrend is strong because it is being supported by increasing volume. When you detect volume price convergence like this, just know that the trend is strong and will likely continue in the near term. On the other hand, there is also what is known as volume price divergence. In an uptrend, this divergence is detectable when volume is decreasing while price is increasing. Simply put, even though the price of the underlying security is pushing higher, there is less and less volume holding up the price, and as such, the price action is anomalous. In a downtrend, this divergence appears when volume is decreasing while price is also decreasing. In other words, even though the price is pushing lower, there is less and less volume to sustain the downtrend for much longer, and as such, the price action, again, is anomalous. In short, when volume is increasing during the dominant trend, the price action is legitimate, signaling potential trend continuation. When volume is decreasing during the dominant trend, however, the price action is anomalous, signaling potential trend reversal. But what about periods of consolidation, where we see small pullbacks from resistance or bounces off of support? How does volume relate to price action during these instances? If, for example, the dominant trend is up, but we are currently experiencing a pullback in a smaller subtrend, volume can signal whether the dominant trend is likely to continue or not. Here, however, trend continuation is not signaled by high volume, but rather by low volume. If the pullback in price occurs with relatively low volume compared to the dominant uptrend, then this is an indication that the uptrend may persist in the short term. A low volume pullback in an uptrend is therefore often regarded as a bullish indicator, especially if it appears amidst one of the common bullish chart patterns discussed previously. Now, on the other hand, if the dominant trend is down, but we are currently experiencing a bounce higher in a smaller subtrend, volume can signal whether the dominant trend is likely to continue. If the bounce in price occurs with relatively low volume compared to the dominant downtrend, then this is an indication that the downtrend may persist in the short term. A low volume bounce in a downtrend is therefore often regarded as a bearish indicator, especially if it appears amidst one of the common bearish chart patterns discussed previously. All that to say, volume, when viewed in correlation with price action, can be a strong indicator for potential trend continuation or reversal. This becomes especially important during periods of accumulation and distribution. As the name suggests, accumulation and distribution are periods in price action where the smart money accumulates, that is, buys shares near local lows before distributing, that is, selling shares near local tops. The important thing to note about accumulation and distribution is that they can last for longer periods of time than you might otherwise anticipate. A strong downtrend typically does not immediately reverse and turn into a strong uptrend without an accumulation phase first. Likewise, a strong uptrend often does not immediately change into a strong downtrend without a distribution phase first. The question, however, is how we figure out that we are actually in an accumulation period near the bottom of a downtrend or if we are simply pausing before another move lower. Similarly, how do we know that we are actually in a distribution period near the top of an uptrend instead of simply pausing before another move higher? This is where volume comes into the picture. Recall the volume price divergence mentioned earlier. If in the midst of a downtrend, we start to see lower and lower volume. This is a sign of an anomaly. The price action is not validated by volume, and as such, we are liable to experience a reversal. Prior to a reversal, however, you should expect some form of accumulation phase to take place, with noticeable volume coming in sporadically during this time. These small bursts of volume during accumulation periods signal that buyers are stepping in and grabbing shares from those who are, are unknowingly selling at the bottom. The opposite is true after an uptrend. If, in the midst of an uptrend, we start to see lower and lower volume, this is a sign of an anomaly. The price action is not validated by volume, and as such, we are liable to experience a reversal. 
Prior to a reversal, however, you should expect some form of distribution phase to take place, with noticeable volume coming in sporadically during this time. These small bursts of volume during distribution periods signal that sellers are stepping in and dumping shares to those who are unknowingly buying at the top. During periods of potential accumulation and distribution, the ability to spot volume anomalies is important. For example, if there is a small green candle in the midst of an accumulation period with massive volume behind it, this could signal that a large buyer stepped in, even though it is not yet reflected in the price action. On the other hand, if there is a small red candle in the midst of a distribution period with significant volume behind it, this could signal that a large seller dumped shares, even though it is not yet reflected in the price. These anomalies can therefore signal to traders when reversal could be on the short-term horizon. This is especially the case if these anomalies manifest in certain candlestick patterns that we mentioned near the outset of this section on technical analysis. Bearing that in mind, let us now revisit shooting stars, hammers, and dojis. As mentioned in our discussion of candlesticks, long lower wicks typically indicate bullish sentiment, whereas long upper wicks typically indicate bearish sentiment. While there are some exceptions to this general rule, we see this especially during periods of accumulation and distribution. If during an accumulation phase, you begin to notice a series of candles with long lower wicks, especially if they have strong volume behind them, that can be a strong indication that an impulse move higher is imminent. Put another way, if you see a lot of hammer candles in the midst of price accumulation, or perhaps dragonfly dojis or spinning tops, then that is a strong sign that buyers are about to take control and push the market higher. The climactic moment of a bullish breakout could happen very soon. On the other hand, if during a distribution phase, you begin to notice a series of candles with long upper wicks with strong volume behind them, then that can be a strong indication that an impulse move down is imminent. Put another way, if you see a lot of shooting stars in the midst of price distribution, or even gravestone dojis or spinning tops, then that is a strong sign that sellers are about to take control and push the market lower. A bearish break to the downside could happen in the next few candles. Now, while there is certainly no guarantee, large volume behind a series of shooting stars, or hammers, and doji candles can be a strong indication that the accumulation or distribution phase is nearing completion and a new trend is about to be established. All right, folks, we have now covered the basics of several key components of technical analysis. It is now your job to tie it all together to help make sure that you comprehend the material we have covered and so that you can make more informed decisions in your trading. Well, everyone, this has been a long course, but I hope you found it worthwhile. Throughout our discussion about technical analysis, we've covered a lot of material. No doubt, you will have to come back and watch some of this material a second time, maybe even a third time, in order to better understand it. But there is no doubt that you are now in a far better position than the vast majority of retail traders. You are now ready to join us in the Discord and become a member of the Internet's premier online trading community. With time, you will have the skills needed to thrive as a trader in this market, and we look forward to watching you grow on that journey. In the meantime, join us in our mission to bring some justice to the stock market.